Good afternoon everyone and welcome to Safari Live. It's a lovely sunny afternoon, about 26 degrees Celsius or about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Nice and warm but very windy. My name is Byron and with me on camera this afternoon is Sebastian, our French connection. <laughs> now um, it's a nice start to the afternoon. Um, as I said it's just nice and warm. Uh, the clouds have disappeared. We had about two days of some cloudy weather. So um, that's good. Now I am not sure what we're going to do this afternoon. For those of you who joined this morning on our sunrise safari, there was a there, there wasn't a fair amount going on here in Juma. Um, we we did some wonderful birding, but we didn't have any predators. We had one hyena, uh, but we've been spoilt the last three days. Lions, leopards, there's been a lot happening. So this morning was a little bit more subdued, but it was still a wonderful morning. Now, James and Scott were in the Mara. They had a lot of predator activity, a lot of lions. And um, so we'll see what we can find this afternoon. Now don't forget everyone, we are completely live. You can send us your questions and your comments. And you can do that via Twitter. Hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us. And uh, we, always, we always enjoy hearing from you. So please send us any questions you might have. Now there was, there was reports of some wild dog this morning. That were on, um, uh, on Torchwood. So to our east. But uh, they, they were apparently heading slowly west. So maybe we're lucky and we get to see some wild dogs today. That would be exciting. I haven't seen wild dogs for quite some time. And I'd love to find some elephant again. It sounds like the Unkuhuma Pride have moved. Um, they are on uh, Biffle's Hook at the moment. We, I just heard an update now. Someone saw them this morning. So they are all the way up there. And I think I heard the males calling this morning and also headed up north into that area. But they spent about three days on Juma. They were feeding on a buffalo that they managed to kill. All right, now we do have the team in the Mara that are joining us this afternoon. Let's go across firstly to James, who would like to say good afternoon to you. Good afternoon everybody and before I get on with my introduction would you please tell Byron that his links take longer than the Jurassic period and they need to be shortened that would be wonderful thank you so much now my name is James Henry you're not going to see me today because on camera today with a spanky new camera is Manu and Manu is got a lens so long that were he to swing it in my direction it would crown me over the top of my nasty little head so uh, he's not going to do that unless I become increasingly nasty in which case he'll probably beat me with it I hope that, that eventuality does not come along so uh, well my name is James as many of you know hashtag Safari Live is how you get hold of us on Twitter you can also chat to us using the YouTube chat stream and indeed if we go live on Facebook you can talk to us on Facebook uh, which brings me neatly around to my plan for the afternoon which is not to look at elephants unfortunately it is to go and find lions interacting with the migratory herds that are all about us here and in fact Manu is now going to show you some wildebeest not too far from where we are this morning we had two male lions I thought they were going to go on the hunt we had to go back to camp came back out here they had absconded I am going to have a long chat with them if I see them again we found another big male lion who will go to very shortly and he unfortunately did kill a very small wildebeest in the middle of the day and he ate himself into a stupor then we found another lioness of the sausage pride and she's sitting quite full with a cub we'll see if we what she she's going to be our sort of default after dark lion uh, and otherwise we're going to just see what else we can find during the course of the light because i'm hoping that we're going to find the well those young males because i think they are the best bet they're quite hungry all righty now making her world premiere from the Masai Mara if you can believe it all the way from the Salt Lick down south we've got T-Bomb Taylor McCurdy James, was that a boxing match? Hello, everybody. Welcome, of course, again to Safari Live. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me is Jean-Dre. 
And yes, I made it safe and sound, missing a bag or two, but hopefully we're going to find all those wonderful things. Remember, this is live, this is interactive. Send through all of your questions, hashtag Safari Live, or you can chat to us on the YouTube chat. Now, we are searching for lions at the moment. Had a very interesting sighting on the back of Scotty's vehicle uh, on the Sunrise Safari, though you didn't see too much of us. Uh, well, you didn't hear me as well. How good I am I being quiet? Well, I thought it was quite impressive. I just sit on my hands. Scott actually shoved a sock in my mouth because I wouldn't keep quiet most of the time. So that's why I was sitting so quietly. And we came to this area and it was really incredible. So we arrived. Firstly, we spotted two lionesses coming down from a small little, out, little, little rocky outcrop and down they came very playful jumping playing around and then we saw a male as well he looked quite large from the distance but we realized that as he came closer he actually wasn't an old male at all he may be around mm, four four years old or so then we spotted another two younger male lions in the distance and they were slightly younger than the other boy anyway the girls not interested in any of them they were playing around they actually looked like they wanted to find something Quite interesting though. The young boys then saw the loner on his own and decided they didn't like his presence anymore and the very smart uh, single lion decided this is not a good idea to get stuck between these two young fresh boys. They looked like they were ready to roll and anyway they just sort of walked and chased him off and moved him out of the area so we're looking for those five lions at the moment. Whether we're going to find them or not I don't know. Whether we're going to make it home that's also well We'll have to see because it's a big space for me to get lost in. <laughs> Luckily, it's open. We've got the escarpment on one side and the river on the other. Anyways, we're going to keep on searching. I'm going to send you back across all the way to my dear friend Byron in the Sabi Sand who is searching for wild dogs. Oh, hello there, Taylor. Nice to have you with us all the way in the Mara. I hope you're enjoying it. And um, don't get lost. It's your first day out there. You're not meant to get lost. <laughs> That's, I'm sure she's very excited to be driving around the Masai Mara, guiding up there. Now, we are indeed in search of wild dogs. Uh, Kondo Leon, you asked, um, what do wild dogs hunt? Well, they will feed on a number of species, mainly antelope, obviously. I mean, antelope, uh, I'm just having a look around here. Antelope from as small as Stienbok all the way to um, Impala and even Kudu. Uh, they, it's amazing what the wild dogs are able to bring down. They work as a pack and, um, and they're very tenacious hunters. This road is very... And Conor Leon, you also wanted to know what hunts the wild dogs? Well, nothing will really hunt the wild dogs, not actively. Um, look, if lions happen to come across wild dogs, then, then yes, they'd probably kill them, purely because it's competition. Um, but, uh, now I actually wonder if these... It sounded like this was the area that they had wild dogs in um, this morning, so I'm looking very, very carefully. I'm just a little bit worried. It looks like the road was graded. So, what I'm saying is, if the road was graded, the chances of a if there was a tractor or anything um, that drove past, then uh, then that may have scared the wild dogs off. I'm trying to have a look to see if there are any vehicle tracks around here, or any sign of these wild dogs lying in the shade somewhere. Actually, a lot of vehicle tracks. It's a problem with it being close to a main road. A lot of vehicle tracks around. But let's have a look and see. So we're going to have to keep our eyes peeled if we want to see some wild dogs lying around here. Um, somewhere in this area, don't know exactly where. What was that that jumped there? <laughs> A little bird perhaps. I 
is exciting but again like I said I'm not sure if these uh, if this, these vehicles had moved through here, they, they graded the roads that could potentially have chased them away but then which direction did they go that's the other thing Nem all the way in the UK, you commenting on how much you love the dogs, the wild dogs, yeah, they're very exciting, very exciting predators to follow and to to watch. Sinak, yes indeed, we track the wild dogs using or hopefully seeing their footprints. But um, for the moment, I'm, I'm having a look. I can see there are some tracks here. But that's from this morning. Those are the tracks from this morning. But I don't know. It's very difficult. You see, the thing is, in these areas, there are a lot of vehicles that move in and out of sightings and around and so it's difficult to get an exact position of where they left them I know what we used to do um, when I was guiding and we still do it in certain areas is uh, maybe just take a prominent uh, branch just a for example one of these peltiforum branches uh, the um, weeping wattle you can take a branch of that, it's green at the moment, so just break it off and we drop it in the road. And that's a nice sign for later, for the afternoon safari. You then know where to start looking. So if they have moved off, if they've disappeared, at least you've got an idea of where to start looking. But now there's something hiding from us in here, and I hope it stays there. Have a look through in the grass, just off to my right. I'm not going to point at it, because I might jump up and run away. Can you see it lying there? Um, <laughs> it's hiding very, very well. Have a look at this, everyone. Look at that little steenbok hiding in the grass. It's got its ears pinned down. <laughs> so it just shows you how difficult it is to spot something in this long grass at the moment. The brown coloration, their camouflage is perfect. This is typical steenbok behavior. They lie dead still and just wait for a predator to hopefully move past or if the predator moves in their direction they'll jump up and run off immediately um, but in a different direction and it doesn't give the predator a chance to hunt them very very clever little antelope but look how well it, it's camouflaged isn't that amazing that's a uh, female no horns only the males have horns Very cute. One of my favorite antelope. Just tiny but very fast, very agile. I'm going to move on so we don't disturb her. But look how well hidden she is. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Sinek, you asked what is the difference between a steenbok and impala? Well, they're completely different antelope. This, the impala is much larger and you've seen all the herds of impala around. I'm sure you would have seen it on Safari Live. We show them almost daily. So they are much larger. They move around in big herds. And, um, and then the, um, the steenbok is small, small antelope, smallest in the area in fact. And they move around usually solitary or in pairs they are often in pairs so completely different the coloration is slightly similar that brown is brownish color but uh, but the impala are much larger oh, i'm looking very carefully around here 
to see if I can see any sign of where these wild dogs would have gone. Bobby, you asked, do I know how the wild dogs got their coloration? Um, I think it was, I think, didn't they um, run into a workshop and spilt some paint on them? <laughs> I'm actually not sure, Bobby. <laughs> that's, that's, the way, <laughs> that's the way they've evolved. It's their coloration. It's, it's like saying, well, how did the antelope become brown? How did the zebra become black and white? Um, it's because red and yellow was taken? I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> the coloration of animals, it's the way they've evolved. It's their camouflage. It's... Um, and I don't know. I see tracks here. Hold on a second. Look like vehicle tracks. Did they go in there? Yeah, they... I think let's maybe look around here. Seb, let's have a good look around here. But I don't see much shade. Now, because it's been a warm afternoon, I'm assuming these wild dogs would potentially look for some shade. A lot of vehicles been a lot of uh, vehicles turning in and out of here, I see. But again, I'm not sure. Let's just, you know what, let's take a chance and drive in here a little bit and just have a look around. Another question from Sinak, you asked if I've got a very memorable sighting with the wild dogs, um, or with wild dogs in the past. I do indeed, I've had some amazing sightings with wild dogs, been very fortunate to follow them and, um, and watch them hunt. But Sinak, probably one of the most memorable, I would say would be uh, one year I followed a pack of wild dogs, they were denning. They ran away from the den and they were off on a hunt and they flushed out two honey badgers. Now you know, a lot of you know, honey badgers are my favorite animals. So I was very excited and these two wild dogs chased the honey badgers and I thought, I thought that they were going to try and kill one. And they ran and they tried to get close to it um, and eventually the honey badgers decided they'd had enough. And what happened was the one honey badger turned around and then decided to fight off the wild dogs by itself and it stood chased them once or twice and the wild dogs quickly gave up and left the honey badgers alone it was amazing to see and that's definitely one of my most memorable wild dog sightings and it was really really awesome Yeah, not looking good for us, Sebastian. Not at all. Mm. See, the thing is, the wild dogs. I mean, they can move around, and especially if there's, if there were maybe too many vehicles moving up and down that main road, could very well have disturbed them, and they could have moved off. Well, I'm going to continue our search around here. Just for a few more minutes. I don't want to give up too soon. Let's head across to Steph, who's apparently watching the river cams, and he's got some crocodiles to show you.
Hello everybody and it's a fantastic afternoon from the Migration Control Room or Erie, whichever way you'd like to look at it here on top of the Ululolo Escarpment. I'm Steph Vinterboer and you are looking at a picture of one of, or from one of our river cameras on the Mara River. The Mara River is that body of water that you are seeing off on your right hand side and that fantastic picture that you get over there downstream of the Mara River. Oh, isn't that just lovely? A lot of water, more water than I've actually seen since I've been in the Mara, and that is because it has been raining in the Mao Highlands, where the Mara River originates from, which is a very tropical forested area, a couple of hundred kilometers north of where we are at the moment, about 200 kilometers north of where we are at the moment, and it is swelling the river substantially. Now just have a look at this picture. Arguably, A very very complex picture to have a look at. Let's go through it. You've got Beauty and the Beast, you've got the Northern Crowned Crane, which is that fantastic bird that you see in the foreground on the left hand side. You have got a group of crocodiles, I don't even know what to, to call them, definitely not a flock, definitely not a raft. You know, as the show is interactive, of course, you're welcome to let me know what we call a collection of crocodiles. But that is a massive amount of crocodiles beached on, an, on, on the sandbank. And then in the right-hand corner of the screen, you've got what looks like a rock, but in, his act is in, in actual fact, a dead wildebeest. And let's go and have a look at this picture in a little bit more detail now with you. This is the northern crowned crane. Oh, excuse me, it's a bit fast over here. Northern crowned crane. And one of the prettiest birds that we find out here. Just have a look at that. Isn't that just a spectacular bird? Crown on the top, they hang around in pairs over here in these like wet, wettish swamplands and eat insects. These grey crown, or these, uh, these, these northern crown cranes, or grey crown cranes, I think I can't actually find which one it is, um, are common in this area. I would say that they're fairly common. I mean, the, big birds are never really common. Obviously, the smaller the bird, the more common they are, with the exception of some stalks in the world. But these cranes you find in relatively high numbers out here, uh, usually in a swampy area and in a pair. I don't know where the other one of this particular pair is. Um, with the exception of perhaps that's what this bird is busy looking at at the moment. In the background there you've got a lot of crocodiles with some of the biggest crocodiles in the Mara River that we've seen in basically underneath this particular camera. This camera is located at a crossing point called Kildesac Crossing, a famous crossing point on the Mara River for pri primarily wildebeest and zebra but I've also seen a lot of Topi crossing here as well. Now let's just have a look at this one crocodile. Actually, has an injury to its face. When crocodiles get really big like this, what happens is they start to f they lose their ability to fish. Firstly, secondly, the few carcasses that they do manage to catch, they are in competition with with the other crocodiles. And what's happened here is most probably a larger crocodile smashing its jaws down on top of this crocodile morsel or another. I'm talking about morsels. Bobby has just asked if these crocodiles would eat the crane. Now Bobby, I don't think that these crocodiles would eat the crane. Firstly, they can't move fast enough. Oh no, we've got a new player in this picture, a olive baboon in the top left hand corner. Um, I don't think that these crocodiles will go after the, the crane, Bobby. It's not really their food source. Big crocodiles like you're having a look at over there are predominantly meat eaters, uh, carrion eaters preferably, and they will catch and kill live prey uh, as often as what they can. Um, the fact that this wildebeest that you're having a look at right now is lying in the shadows is testimony to that. What happens is the crocodiles would have killed this wildebeest either while it was cro crossing or it's a drowned wildebeest that came floating down the river, which is fairly common here. And this, these crocodiles are all full and cold. And they'll be lying in the sun now. And as this carcass gets softer and easier to tear apart, the crocodiles will then move to feed it. And, uh, and I think that's exactly what's happening over here. This wildebeest carcass is either washed up here on the bank or it was killed and left. But isn't that just some fantastic story there 
Wow. Ukraine really doing a bit of a dance at the moment. Anyway, who, uh, without further ado, why don't we send you over to James, who seems to have bumped into a lioness for you. We're live. Hello, everybody. We're live. I've managed to pull my ear out. What a total idiot I am. I want to smack myself in the face. But I'm not going to do that because we found a lioness. Now, this is the same lioness as we... Yeah, same uh, lioness that we managed to find this morning. Excuse the audio problems. I'm trying to replace my hat. And we found her today, this morning, and she went sort of down through into this forested area. And she is now... I think has still not eaten since this morning and quite close by to an enormous herd of wildebeest. In fact, two or three enormous herds of wildebeest. So I think this is where we're going to park ourselves for the foreseeable future. And with any luck, when she deigns to get up and get herself some supper, we'll be on hand to observe. And you can see Manu has created a very beautiful picture there with the uh, very artistically placed dead stump and the lioness with her missing ear. Well, missing top right bit of ear. Rebecca, are you speaking to me? Ah. Hello, Roshni. You say, what a sweet-looking lion. Yeah, yes, until you try to go up and tickle her under her chin. Then I think you'd find her sweetness would dissipate rather quickly. Rather in the manner of a Zymenia caffra fruit. Or the sour plum, which is very sweet on the outside and deeply sour on the inside. Not so, David. David is helping Manu with the new camera, by the way. I must just, while you look at that lion, uh, announce the arrangement of the car so far. We have Manu on the camera and David lying in front of it underneath the sized lens, trying to keep his bonce out of the way. And he looks like a sort of reclining uh, and deeply decadent Roman of some sort. I'm not sure what his vibe is, but <laughs> that's what he's going for at the moment. I think that's a very good idea, Rebecca. Stand by one. I will do exactly that while we look at this lion. And the reason it is just a slightly wobbly picture is she's, we haven't got very close to her. And so every time we kind of move on the car, it does look a little bit sort of, uh, well, wobbly. Right, David. Right, here we go, everybody. Um, I, no, I can't show it to you. I'll tweet it. I'll tweet it to Safari Live. <laughs> I can't show it to you because unfortunately, well, the camera lens is just too long. <laughs> now, Sinak, you want to know how old this lioness is, and my answer to you is going to be younger than she looks. Her ears make her look a little bit older than I think she is, but she's actually in very good condition. Her teeth are still very sharp, and although she looks like she's got a bit of a beard, which is not particularly attractive, um, I think you'll find that she is probably in the region of five to six years old. So, fully adult, but she's not old by any stretch. That would be my, that would be my guess. Uh, right, hashtag Safari Live. <laughs> LK, very nice question from Manu. I've just tweeted the picture of David and I. Um, you say, is it... <laughs> You say, is it difficult to sit still on the car with all of James? Looks very amusing. He just sort of smiles politely when I make a joke, um, which is very kind of him. Uh, Dave uh, knows me well enough to know that he has to laugh at my jokes, and so he laughs politely and rolls his eyes heavenward when I make a joke. But Manu has yet, has yet to realise that he has to laugh at my jokes, or I'll get very hurt. Uh, 
Right. We are going to sit here, I think, for the foreseeable future. As I said, we'll keep coming back to check what this lioness is doing. In the meantime, Byron apparently is searching for the wild hounds of Africa. I am indeed, James, searching for the wild hounds of Africa. No luck yet. No luck at all. <clears throat> but, you know what? We might as well try and keep a good eye out. You never know. Persistence often pays off. So, we'll try our best and see if we can find the dogs. Again, I'm not sure which pack it was this morning. If it was a pack of three or more. I'm scanning very carefully because it's been quite hot. I think these wild dogs would be lying in the shade somewhere. Um, not out in the sun. So let's see, let's see. Also need to do some birding I think. Oh we saw Sebastian and I saw a Koki Franklin. But we didn't get it on camera. It's me, you asked how much ground can a wild dog cover in a day? Um, in a morning, and I'll tell you this morning, I think they must have covered close to, uh, I would say between six, no, maybe between five and eight kilometers this morning, I think. Somewhere around there. So that's quite a quite a distance. They can cover huge distances. They um, built for long distance running. They they run down their prey. They work as a pack, and they'll cover huge distances. And when they are looking for food, um, so yeah, they can cover between five and ten kilometers very very easily in the morning or in an afternoon. I think generally they, they cover less distance in the afternoon because they usually get active a little bit later so they might not run as far but in the mornings and especially a morning like today it was nice and cool so they probably would have run further because they would have run for a longer time in the morning. And there is an impala. Now, oh, um, let me just quickly show you this Impala. Um, I think it was Cenac you asked the difference between Stenbock and Impala. And as I said, I'm sure you've seen Impala many times. But just to double, double check, you can see, look at the size of that Impala compared to that um, little Stenbock that we saw in the grass. Very different. The Stienbock is about the size of the neck of that Impala. <laughs> Just about. They're very small compared to an Impala, which is much bigger, but also not the largest antelope. So there we go. There you can see the difference. George, you asked if um, locals feed on the antelope in this area or in this area or around. George, people feed on the antelope species, species throughout South Africa. Springbuck, Kudu, Impala, um, the, the Oryx, I think at times too, Vullabies, you can eat all those, those antelope. It's venison, it's a wild game, or, or wild meat. Um, springbuck and Kudu are particularly tasty and very nice, to be honest. Um, but they won't, they won't uh, eat them from the game reserves. Uh, oh, these are some white crested helmet shrikes just flying off. There they go. See if we can get a view of them quickly. Now we have seen them for our bird list. We're doing a kind of birding week. Let's see how many birds we can get. And this morning we reached the 70 mark. So we're on 70 species, we've still got a few more that we need to try and find. See, I'd like to get over 80, to be honest. It's interesting, I've noticed, just following these bird parties, that um, often a, uh, what is it, um, sorry, hold on, I think I just saw something, what is this little guy?
Is that not a yellow fronted petronia? Did you did you did you see it? What was on there? Hang on a second. Um, yellow throated yellow throated petronia, I think. Petronia. <laughs> Let me try and find it for you quickly. Yellow throated petronia. And I think that's exactly what it was. Yellow throated petronia. Did you did we see it, Megs? Did you see, manage to get it there? Oh, oh, Megan says maybe not. Let's well, see. It took, it, 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 it took off as Semp focused on it. Well, I tell you what, let's ask the viewers quickly. Does does the yellow petronia, yellow throated petronia count? Um, I, I, I saw it, but I don't know if it was on, uh, on camera. So, why don't you let us know? Does it count or not? I hope it counts. <laughs> No. I think there are a number of them flying through there. Again, when you start getting to these numbers, to get more birds on camera is very tricky. Oh, the light's also not great, Sebastian. James in the Mara. James Henry says no it doesn't count it wasn't seen correctly or, or nicely on the camera okay James you're the boss <laughs> oh but now apparently a lot of viewers are saying it does count you know what why don't we just try find another one just to make sure just to make sure look if I'm on 79 by the end of the week if I'm on 79 by the end of the week we will add it to the list to make 80 <laughs> still no sign Sinak, you asked how many uh, p uh, Petronia species do we get in, in uh, is it Africa or Southern Africa? I'm not sure about Africa, but Southern Africa, we, um, we only have, yeah, you know, Southern Africa, Sinak, we only have one, the yellow, yellow front of Petronia. I'm not sure about the rest of Africa. I don't know, to be honest, anywhere else, um, if there are Petronia species, maybe. Looking very carefully. All right. Okay. Well, Andy, um, you uh, you were asking us this morning about a bird that was confusing you, and you said it's the pink-necked pigeon. Was that it? Pink-necked pigeon. Um. Pink necked green pigeon. Where is that from, Andy? It's definitely not Southern Africa. So, no wonder I, did, I wasn't sure, I wasn't exactly sure what you were talking about. I um, wonder where you saw that, Andy. Was that uh, perhaps in the Mara? I don't know if they see it up there, maybe. Why don't we ask James if the pink necked a green pigeon is found up in that area. He's still sitting with that lioness. Let's go across to him. The pink green pigeon. No, I don't think I've heard of a pink green pigeon in the Mara. So I'm going to say no, no pink green pigeon in the Mara. Uh, the green pigeon, yes, does occur from time to time. And this lioness is neither a pink or green pigeon. In fact, she is not a pigeon at all. 
and I just don't want to get too close to her. This morning she was a little bit, uh, just slightly nervous of vehicles around her, and so we're just going to give her some space. And I also wanted to say to you, um, we had I had a question from Ket, I think it was Ket, and you said, it is Ket, you said, what's the zoom range on that new camera? Now, the zoom range, for those who are technically minded, is 50 millimeters to 1000 millimeters so that is an enormous zoom and it also has an extender uh, one and a half times extender is it and um, well we can show you can we show you them how that works is that possible so we'll go in go to the end of the lens there Manu and just excuse the jerking around because once we do get to the end of the lens even if you breathe on the car it starts to sort of shake around a bit and there's quite a lot of wind so that is that a thousand or was that a thousand five hundred? That's a thousand. And then if we put the oh, there we go. We can almost see into the inside of her ear there. Right. So that's the lens. But well, the whole point behind this camera, and for those of you who are not technically minded, I, I'll try and make it as entertaining as possible. This camera is a low light camera, so I mean normally we wouldn't really use it at this time of the day. It's perfectly adequate for this time of the day, but it's real kind of, it comes on to, into its own when the sun starts to set. And most of our good cheetah stuff has been shot on this camera, and most of our nighttime stuff that we've sort of reproduced and used in highlights clips and catch up clips and replays have been shot on this camera with this lens. So that's what's going on here. I hope you all find that very, very entertaining. Now, now, our Lara Moore, you're wondering why this lioness is alone, and I cannot tell you the answer to that question. Safe to say, in fact, I can't tell you. I thought when I saw her this morning, I thought that she was perhaps um, coming to feed some cubs, but it was very clearly pointed out to me by Jean-André that she is not lactating. So it is not the fact that she, there are cubs here at all. I don't know why she's alone. She's the hungriest lioness I've seen in the Mara. Uh, that doesn't mean to say she's hungry, but she's certainly the skinniest one I've seen. And the fact that she's come out of this drainage line now, and it's in such close proximity to the herds, I think gives a good indication that she is probably quite hungry and looking to go on the hunt when conditions become favorable. And that will be as soon as the sun dips below the escarpment just behind us. That will happen in the next, uh, I'm going to say, hour or so. It's also quite windy, which will be good for her. So we'll see what happens going forward this evening. All right, apparently we're going now onto the river with Stephanie the Hippo. I'm not sure what that means. Stephanie the Hippo, indeed. Um, thank you, James. I don't quite know what these hippos are doing. It looks like we may have some mating going on of some hippo, which is a very rare occurrence to actually see. In particular, yes, we definitely have some mating going on. <laughs> which is quite a rare occurrence to actually see on, uh, on Safari Live. And there we go. The, this is... Uh, frozen a little bit thankfully but you can see that this male hippo is mating with a female in the water which is something that we quite often talk about at safari live but we don't often see this is the first time that i think i've been able to show anybody mating on the program or that i've actually heard about and you can see that it happens in the water birth birthing of the hippo calf happens um, on land but the Actual mating happens in the water, and you can see that the poor female hasn't had a breath in quite some time now. now it doesn't see, there we go, there the nose comes up with this female. This would be the bull hippo in this particular pod that is the biggest and uh, obviously the strongest and most suitable for a partner for her, and of course to father her 
youngsters. And you can see that they've made their way a little bit further away from the rest of the pod. There is a youngster probably, oh, there we go, there's another couple looking on um, with some interest. Hippo, of course, very social creatures. And what happens is as soon as there's some activity around, they're all quite inquisitive and will come and see what's happening. Now, what I don't know and what I can't tell you is how long this is going to go on for. I have never seen this before with my naked eye. And... Um, and I don't know whether it's going to last long, like a rhinoceros, for instance, which can go on for 40 minutes or so, or whether it's going to be short, which, uh, like a lion, a couple of seconds, two or three seconds. Now, Francis, all the way from Israel, you've just asked me, is it possible that she could drown? Francis, just judging from the sheer number of hippo in this river, I doubt that this is something that is uncommon, and that... You know, mating in the water with bull hippo that can weigh up to, you know, three, sometimes even four tons. Uh, mating in the water would make it a lot easier than mating on land. Now, how long can hippo hold their breath for is also part of this question. Now, Francis, hippo can hold their breath for, bull hippo can hold his breath for about eight minutes, seven or eight minutes uh, at a long stretch and a newborn calf can hold their breath for about 30 to 40 seconds. So I don't know if we can count the breaths that this female's taking, but there's one there and we can start our stopwatch there, but I would assume that she's not holding her breath for longer than 30 seconds or so, 30 seconds to a minute. So this, you know, tolerating this bull hippo doing his thing is probably well within her ability to hold her breath. Now it looks like he's slid off there. There's the female going forward, yes, and the male has gone underwater to, I don't know, hide away. <laughs> but, so that answers your question. So mating doesn't take very long. Looks like it takes between sort of three and five minutes, and the hippo, once done, moves off. Now, Sinat, you wanted to know if this hippo, once she's had her baby, once she's had her baby, which will be if she falls pregnant to this coupling, uh, which will be in about eight months' time, how many babies is she going to have? And Cmax, she's going to have one baby. It's usual only for hippo to have one baby at a time. Um, there's not, it's not uncommon for any mammal to have twins, but for these large mammals with ultra long gestation periods that need to give birth to babies that are are able to look after themselves in the case of a hippo able to swim from birth um, it would make sense that uh, that she only gives birth to one baby and uh, she'll give birth to this little calf if this coupling is successful uh, in about eight to nine months time interestingly for an animal that weighs exactly the same as a white rhinoceros uh, it is half the gestation time and isn't that an amazing fact? Half the gestation time, and from what I understand about it, simply because um, hippos have a good diet and they live fairly unstressed lives, half of which is in water. Now, what we're going to be doing is sending you all the way south down to South Africa and Byron, who is on a birding adventure. I am indeed, Steph. I've decided to try and focus on the birds again. We've had no luck with the wild dogs, and unfortunately the information we got is just too confusing. No one can tell us exactly where they left the wild dogs. I don't think anyone followed them until they actually went and lay down. So, it's, uh, it's impossible. Driven around, they could, they could very well be on Simbambili or Arethusa already. I'm not sure. So that's unfortunate, but you never know. Maybe they pop up somewhere a little bit later. We're going to head down towards a waterhole. Apparently that bird, <laughs> that bird that was getting us a little confused this morning, um, the <laughs> which turned out to be the pink-throated green pigeon. So the reason why we didn't know about it, and neither did James, was because it does not occur in Africa. It, uh, it's apparently found in Cambodia and the Philippines, Myanmar and Singapore. So no wonder we didn't know it. So Safari Live is in Africa. <laughs> we, don't, we don't get those birds. <laughs>
I wonder if we'll see those yellow-throated petronias again. Let's see if we can f find one. There's actually quite a few of them around. We just need to get them on camera. It will be quick enough because it's quite difficult at times. So I thought I saw something. What is this? Is it, have a look at this now. It's not a, not bush walk, but we still look for some of the smaller things. Have a look at the tip of this branch, Sebastian. Can you see this one leaning over yeah. towards us? The white thing. There we go. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. It's a pupa of sorts. Something different, a pupa. I don't know what that would be from. Uh, possibly a... A moth or a or a wasp? Uh, I don't know. Let me just jump out the vehicle for a second. Just want to try and get a closer look. Stay with us. Try and see what this is. Oh, I have no clue what that pupa is from, but I would I would guess something like a. Looks quite big, so. I wonder if it isn't a, a wasp pupa of sorts, or a or a large moth. I don't know. I don't know. But it's interesting. It's nice to see something different like that, and it stands out quite nicely on that branch. So as I was saying, you know, we don't just look for the big stuff. Also, if we spot something interesting like that, but it is definitely a cocoon or pupa of sorts. So um, apparently quite a few of you are agreeing with me that it, it looks like possibly from a wasp. I wonder what species of wasp though, but, but that's quite large. So. <clears throat> it's always nice to see interesting little things like that in the bush. <coughs> Excuse me. Delrez, you asked about any invasive species of birds. Now, I suppose we do. Well, those crows. Those crows are considered invasive and pests. They're not meant to be here, and they, they come in to the area from time to time. So the crows. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the a bird called the Indian miner. There's uh, uh, the miner birds. They um, they not meant to be here. They're invasive. Uh, what else? What else? Uh, uh, off the top of my head now, I can't think of any others. Um, I suppose feral pigeons to an extent. Hang on, what bird was that? What bird was that? Uh, just have a look. I thought, ah, oh, you know what? I think it was a parrot, perhaps. Let's head across back to James, um, who's still sitting with that lioness, and see what she's up to. Ah, uh, you know, we'll do the wildebeest through there, or the zebra through there, and I'll drive round. Hello everybody, I was just making a plan there. If you heard me calling, I'm still talking, I'm sorry about that. Um, right, there we have the zebra through and over the top of the drainage line. And I'm just looking with my binoculars there. Lots and lots of wildebeest and zebra across that side. So she's got options there. Then if we zoom out again, Manu, if you don't mind. I'm just going to drive slowly around the corner here. We're still with the lion, she hasn't moved at all. Let's go around the corner. And this is a little bit jerky, I know, because of this long lens. Sorry for that. And there is a vast swathe 
of animal life off to the right hand side there. There it is. And further right from that. I mean that is all along the Mara River. I'm amazed there haven't been any crossings today. We've obviously kept our eyes peeled on the cameras where Steph is sitting now. I'm utterly astounded there hasn't been a crossing today. Anyway, if we keep panning to the right, man, if you don't mind, what we will get. We keep going, keep going, keep going. Is the group that is much closer to this lioness, who I think she's going to eventually have a go at. Just keep going, keep going right. Keep going. Keep going. There, that's the one. Now, Rebus, this is a very appropriate question for this time. You say, how far away is this herd from the lion? This herd is probably about 200 meters or so. So call that about 700 feet. They really are not very far. The herd that we were looking at through the trees, probably about maybe 500 feet or so. About 150 meters. So they're not far away. And she certainly wouldn't think twice about having a go at them, especially as the darkness starts to fall. Ooh, there's a crowned hornbill flying over. It's gone. Too late. Isn't that nice? Beautiful shot there. And then I'll just show you the lioness again, so you, sh you can see where she is. And slowly back up. So I think we might get quite a nice picture of her from here, actually. Yeah, Armando, I think you're going to... this would be a better angle for you. There we go. I don't think that branch will be in your way. We just need to swing it round. There we go. There she is. She just every so often lifts her head to look at the wildebeest, look at the zebra, have a bit of a yawn, display her sharp fangs to the world. She doesn't go back down in there. I wonder if there aren't other lions in there. I'd be very surprised uh, if there wasn't some connection with the lions in there. She could, uh, like I say, I'm also confused as to who she is. It's possible she's a member of the Angama Pride, except that all of those lionesses, especially the ones with the scaffy ears, have got very little cubs, and they all would or should look like they have been or are lactating. And she does not. So I think she is a member of the Sausage Pride. Hmm. Oh, nice, nice question here from... Uh, the name escapes me, M.A. Right, M.A., you say she, she looks quite pale. Is she part of the same pride that we had during the last TV show with Jamie? There was a very pale cub, little lioness there. The answer is yes, I think she is part of the same pride, but she's definitely not the mother of that cub. I don't think she's um, pale at all. I think she's actually pretty pretty dark, pretty tawny. But we did see, remember I mentioned at the very beginning of this drive, I mentioned the lioness that we saw that was very full with a cub. That was the one. And that lioness, or well, the cub itself, is still quite pale, obviously. It hasn't changed colour since, <laughs> since uh, Saturday. But her mother, same colour as this. Now, as you can see, this lioness has got a skinny belly. And that is very unusual for a lion at this time of the year. And so I think she's by far our best bet for a cat on the hunt. My suspicion is that she's going to wait for dark, but it might she might not. She might decide that she can go pull, or certainly have a go, while we still have some light. Let's see what she does. I don't want to move, like I say, she's just very slightly nervous. And so I'm just going to let Manu follow her with the camera for now. I will have to move eventually, because Manu's going to start filming a pole soon, which was not going to be very attractive. Is it, Manu? No, he says. He agrees with me that a pole is not of the top. Are you in the pole already? If you can hear heavy breathing, it's because David is fast asleep behind me on the camera box. Okay, I'm going to have to move. Zoom out, Manu. I'll just swing for you quickly. This is quite exciting. We have some movement. 
She's not paying any attention to us, so that's good. There we are. It's con conveniently stopped as I hit something. I'm not sure what it was. Hopefully nothing fatal. She's hunting now. See, she's going to get behind this termite mound and use it as a vantage. She's flattened her ears out already. We might be onto something here already. Okay, Manu, let's get um camera back. Zoom out. Okay. Let's move around here. Now, Jeanette, you say do lionesses usually hunt on their own? They don't usually hunt on their own, they will happily hunt on their own. And there's certainly some research that shows lionesses that hunt on their own often eat as much as lionesses in prides of two or three. So it is entirely possible that she will choose to hunt on her own as the evening gets a little bit darker. That's a wonderful shot of there, there on that termite mound. I wonder how many times we've driven past her. The hunting expedition seems to have stopped. That's okay for now. Rebecca thinks she looks mad. Rebecca, I don't think she looks mad at all. I think she looks fairly calm, despite the fact that David's asleep in the sighting of her. She's definitely watching the wildebeests. Anyway, we're going to sit right here and not move. I'm also hoping desperately that everybody else has given up coming to visit this lioness because we obviously want to watch her hunt on our own. Now, I believe that Baron is still looking for number 71 on his bird list, which means, of course, that he did not, very gentlemanly like, count the yellow throated Petronia, which he didn't show you properly. Good for him. Back to him. Him. Him, him. <laughs> No, James, I didn't. Like I said, <clears throat> if we get to 79 and I need an extra one, I will count the, um, the yellow-throated Petronia. Maybe we can just find some more. So, I've just been driving around having a look again to see if we've, there's any sign of these wild dogs, but nothing, unfortunately. Um, so we're heading down towards one of the dams, going to have a look around the water. It was warm this afternoon. Maybe we're lucky and we get something that moved down to go for a drink. Scanning the tops of termite mounds. never know we could spot a leopard on there maybe <laughs> wishful thinking but oh there quickly Sebastian <laughs> crowned lapwing <laughs> well, well done Sebastian I mentioned this morning we hadn't seen a crowned lapwing yet so there we go <laughs> we got it 71 <laughs> Well done, Sebastian. <laughs> uh, it's so funny. We <laughs> get so excited now about these birds. Racking up the numbers slowly but surely. Hang on, what little birds are these? These might be our Petronias. Ah, golden-breasted buntings. Lovely to see them, but uh, we don't... Hang on, there we go. Seb, on the right-hand branch, um, if you go... So that branch that's leaning over to the side, just on the tip of it, um, go to the tip. There we go, there it is. No, you had it to the right, to the right. Oh, there he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. There he is. That is the yellow throat of Petronia, is it not? It is indeed. There we go. An official sighting of the yellow throated Petronia. I'm just going to double check, but I'm almost certain 
Um, I probably won't even have to check. Ah, it is indeed. There it is. I'll show you again um, for you to. Sh that was the um, uh, an adult. You can see that very white supercilium. That's the uh, the word they use for the white eyebrow supercilium. Brown uh, br brown bird with the um, those. But yeah, definitely yellow throated petronia. That's the view we got to the back. Wonderful. 72. James, we've got our yellow throated Petronia. <laughs> he can't argue with that. Oh, where that little one? Oh no, look there. What is that? Isn't that a red-headed finch? It is a red-headed weaver. Sorry, red-headed weaver. There it goes. Oh, we've got it. We got it. Can you can you see it, Seb? Oh, there we go. Wonderful, wonderful red-headed weaver. That's great. I haven't seen one of those for a while. Yeah. Well, well spotted, Seb. Hey, huh? look at that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. Megan, sorry, can you repeat that question, please? Mm -hmm. uh, Andy, you asked, are most birds monogamous? No, Andy, they are not. I'm just scanning. There was a lot of birds that flew off here. No, Andy, they're not. Some birds will um, just mate once. Other times you might get uh, you, you might get um, um, birds mating uh, that are monogamous. It does happen from time to time. Um, sometimes you get males mating with different females. What is that little guy? Uh, what is it? What is it? I can't see what it is. It's hiding behind that branch now. Hang on, let's see if it moves. That's the Petronia. Yeah, that's the Petronia. No, yeah. Um, some bird species, Andy, the females may have a number of male um, suitors. So uh, they'll have. Hang on, I, there's a, I spotted a lark. Looked like the flight of a lark. No, no, I apologize. It's a bunting, it's a bunting, golden breasted bunting, but it had a similar movement to the to a lark. Um, so one bird I can think of is the African jacana. Female has a number of male um, partners and the males actually look after the, the chicks and the nest. They'll sit on the nest and the female will mate and just lay the eggs. Now that is known as... Oh wait, I need to think of hitting, hitting a blank now. Um, they, oh, zebra. There it goes, there it goes a zebra. That's a nice surprise. Um, Sure, everyone, I apologize. I've hit a complete blank. What, the name for um, for a female with many male partners. Uh, uh, polyandrous. Polyandrous. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So they are polyandrous. It means they've got number of male partners nice to see a zebra again Amanda you were saying how much you love seeing zebra and they are always nice to see. Look how well that camouflage actually suits them in these conditions. And the zebra basically disappears um, 
amongst those grey branches of the dead trees at the moment. It really makes it difficult to to spot. If we were driving past, to be honest, I don't think you'd spot that zebra unless it moved. That was nice. Some impala that were just crossing the road in front of us. I'm still heading down to the water hole just to see. Maybe there's something around there. There's a whole herd of impala around here. So I doubt there are any predators for now. Oh, watch the male. There he goes. Uh, Paul, you asked if I've ever had a pet bird. Uh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, nope, no pet bird. We, we are a, um, a dog family. We've always had dogs. And um, I think it's another bunting that was just landed there. Oh, don't worry, Seb, they flew off quite quickly. Yeah, golden breasted bunting again. There's plenty of them around. They're beautiful birds. So, um, yeah, we are a dog family. We always had dogs as pets, not cats. Um, yeah, uh, don't, know, don't know why. We just never really had cats. And um, but, but always dogs. Seb, have you ever had a pet bird? No. No. No, that's not me. No. She had a parrot. Okay, okay. I'm also dogs. Okay, Sebastian says it's also a dog family. <laughs> Part of the canine family. <laughs> um, my nickname actually. <laughs> Uh, my nickname at or started at Londolosi and it's, it's still it's kind of stuck today. Is B Dog. <laughs> don't know why. I don't know why it, or where it came from. Maybe James maybe James can shed some light on it. He was there when they gave me that nickname. And B Dog. <laughs> and it's it's stuck to this day. A lot of my friends still call me B Dog. I actually don't know where to look anymore. I'm scanning the trees, I'm scanning the ground. I obviously like to find some more animals. I'm, I'd love to find some elephant this afternoon. Haven't seen a nice herd of elephant for quite some time. That's how it goes, you know, the animals move around and every now and then they'll arrive again. Let's see, approaching the water here quickly. Sinak, you asked what types of larks do we have here? We've got, we actually have a lot of larks. They're, I'll have to go through the list, but there's, there are many different larks around. Um, anything potentially dangerous or that can eat us here? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Sebastian, would you like to go ahead and, uh, and do your time lapse quickly yeah jump off Sebastian's gonna jump off he's doing the time lapse pictures of um, um, of a certain scenery so um, so Sebastian's gonna jump off and
take a photo there. Yeah, don't worry, I'll, I'll control the camera. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, it's always nice to come down to the water and have a look around to see if there is anything here, um, anything came to drink. I can hear some ox peckers flying around, but I don't think because they're sitting on any animals. I think um, I think probably just because they're nesting in the in the tree. So, and looking around just to scan, maybe we find another bird or two. <clears throat> this is actually quite strange having a cameraman off the vehicle and just me and you <laughs> back home. So there's something different. Some crested Franklins walking on the bank opposite us. So there's always there's a lot of crested Franklins around in this area actually. Now, Cnac, actually, you were asking about uh, about the um, the birds. Sorry, I thought I heard something. Ah, uh, you know what it is. I'm hearing is there's a knocking sound, knocking sound of a woodpecker in the distance. Anyway, let's get back to those larks that, um, that I said I would find out for you. Now, I said there's plenty larks. There's plenty. Um, let's see if we can count them. In southern Africa, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Thirty-one, thirty-one species of larks. See that? Many species. As I said, this area: rufous nape lark, uh, monotonous lark, sabota lark. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I, I, I th there, there are a few more. Um, anyway, I'll try to think of them. But let's head back to James um, with his lioness, and maybe he'll tell you more about my nickname <laughs> if he's bored. <laughs> Oh no. Now, what we have here is our lioness, obviously. She's moved on to a termite mound in the sun. I think she was getting a little bit chilly, as was I. I put my jacket on. And she's eyeing the herd. She's just a slight bit closer. There was one zebra who was standing guard, and he still seems to be standing guard. Uh, Manu, can we see the zebra that is standing guard? And he's the only animal in this entire swathe of thousands that's looking in the wrong direction. In the wrong direction if you happen to be the lioness. Why he's looking there is anyone's guess. But I'm hoping that quite soon he'll turn around. And I suspect that his position where he is, then I think it's quite possibly why she has not made a further move. Now, if I got my words just a bit mixed up there, it's because I was assaulted in the ear by the news that apparently I gave Byron the name B-Dog and he doesn't know why. Um, well, it's because his name begins with a B. There we are. And because, well, you know, in the 90s one called uh, people of um, sort of gangsterish quality dog at the end. Uh, Snoop Dog comes to mind. And so B Dog, given that he comes from the south of Johannesburg, seemed entirely appropriate. Now he knows. Lioness, gone to sleep. But not really. She's just put her ears down. And she's definitely still watching very carefully for what's going on there. But that pyjama donkey the other side really needs to turn around and go and join his friends because he's scuppering our plans. I'm quite sure that isn't even a vague concern for him. We have some um, a number of safari goers now taking pictures of our vehicle. So what I've taken to doing is taking pictures of them. And then they look very disturbed and they put their cameras back in their cars. It's quite funny. They're now all grinning and laughing and still taking pictures. <laughs> oh, they're all taking pictures now. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and waving because they think they're on television. Um, David is finds this quite amusing. The pajama donkey is unamused because I think that he thinks there's something up here, and I suspect that he's been telling his friends, guys, I promise you, there's something, there's something not right in this area, and all 
200,000 of his closest friends have turned their backs on him and said, you're a paranoid delinquent and we're not listening to you. And there he stands, the lone voice amongst thousands. Look at them, they don't care at all. They've all turned their backs thinking that he's just paranoid. Well, he isn't. There we go, let's go back to him. Her, sorry. Sometimes it's difficult to tell if she's pushing her ears down in order to stay camouflaged or if it's just because she's missing half her ear. She seems to be uh, licking her chops slightly. It looks like she might be feeling slightly nauseous. Well, there we go. You see how skinny she is? She's just having a good stretch. Oh no, don't go down in there. No, what she's doing is just using some cover. We're just going to, well, I'm not going to move. She's just getting behind some cover, possibly feeling a little bit uh, like she needs some grass to eat to help with the in oncoming meal. The pajama donkey is now making his donkey-like bray. I think he's alarm calling. He knows she's there, you know. I'm watching the lioness. She's starting to look a little bit green about the gills. Ooh, dear, she needs a sturger on. Ooh, ooh. Oh. Mm, this might be a bit disturbing for some. Oh, oh, come on, get it out. Oof. Gosh, I feel quite ill having watched that. That really is disgusting. I'm taken back to my days as a child and I go into my room and find that the Burmese cat had done precisely the same thing on my carpet. And then I was always torn between disgust for the cat and then fear of what would happen to it once my father discovered the vomit. Don't worry, my cat didn't abuse, my father didn't abuse the cat. My cat did abuse my father, but not the other way around. <laughs> oh, and I just needed to tell you that Taylor does not have any signal. She is with some lions. She had a brief flash of signal. I was about to link to her there, but she's got no signal. Now, the reason she is remaining with those lions is that they will probably go on the hunt as it gets a bit darker. And so what that means is that she will stay with them while there is a little bit of, or she'll stay with them while the herd's around. Let's head across to her now. We're going to see if it works. Well, we ended up three It's not one of the lions that we were looking for earlier on. Unfortunately, they have done a disappearing act and disappeared in the long grass, I suspect. But isn't this absolutely beautiful? It was actually quite funny as you're driving on and racing and bouncing about. It's wildebeest everywhere. You know, trying to swim through them. Zebra, you absolutely name it. Every single animal that you could see was out in the open. And we unfortunately were just in, in Tanzania just about. And they don't have signal there. But we're here. And as we're racing along, uh, Jean-Dre said, oh, what's the word you use, Jean-Dre? A marumpet. Did I say that correctly? I just said, like, you, I thought you were asking me about my armpit, and I didn't think lions would like to go in my armpit. But anyways, the marumpet, Jean-Dre was like, they actually really like to hang around here. It's a great spot. And I said, I can see why. And as I said, I can see why. I had to hit the brakes because this lovely lion, and this was just laying about. Let's go to, quickly go across to James. Hello everybody, welcome to this Facebook Live broadcast. We're sitting here with a lioness who keeps thinking about hunting a great swathe of wildebeest. She's just unfortunately laying down again. We're going to go across, I'll show you where they are. There they are, hundreds of thousands of them. 
all with their backs turned to her and what we're doing now is pretty much just setting up this hunt we're going to be with this lioness for some time now because she's hungry she looks like the hungriest lioness i've seen in the Masai Mara and that's not to say that she's starving by any stretch but because things are so bountiful at the moment most of the cats can barely breathe for the amount of food they have in their stomachs this is not the case with this lioness and she keeps getting up and moving close to these wildebeest and zebra. She's now obviously gone down to sleep as we've broadcast this. So I'm going to show you one more thing. We've got a zebra off to the side and he is the lone member of this entire grouping of probably, I don't know, a hundred thousand wildebeest and zebra that I can see from where I'm sitting. There she, there he is waiting of course are, you, are we on facebook at all i'm confused now the lone member waiting oh sorry everybody i i thought we were on a facebook live at the moment that's why i've said exactly the same thing that you've heard 150,000 times let's go back to byron who's found number 74. oh we'll, we'll try our best james we'll try our best <laughs> So, uh, B-Dog because I was a gangster. James, is that it? <laughs> now, I'm going to have a look. Let's check our, our little owl hole. I found an owl here the other day, and I wonder... I don't see a face sticking out there at all at the moment. No. No owl sitting around there. There was a pearl sp spotted owl that was in that one hole in there. Oh, I found one to my right. Have a look at this in the tree. Um, right just over here. Can you see it there, Seb? Look there, everyone. There's an owl. That's a pearl spotted owl. <laughs> There we go, look at that hiding, hiding from us there, but not hiding well enough. <laughs> look at those eyes peering at us through there. Now I wonder if this is perhaps an owl that lives in that hole, I'm not sure. I don't know, but I just heard a little whistle that they occasionally give, you might hear it. Okay. It's a soft little whistle. Very well hidden there. Lovely. I always love seeing these little owls. <laughs>